Welcome back, everybody, and welcome to those who are just joining us. Now, thusly, we begin part two of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. As part two opens, we get a bunch of poetry talking about the passing of the seasons, and I know nobody reads anymore, but it's basically like the literary version of a montage. So, the year has already passed, and Sir Gawain is getting all gussied up because you gotta look your absolute best when you're on a quest to get your head whacked off, am I right? Yet until All Saints Day, with Arthur he lingers, and he made a festival and a feast for the fighter's sake. With much revel and richness of the round table, knights full courteous and comely ladies, all for love of that lad and longing they were. But nevertheless, nor the latter, they spoke only of mirth. Many joyless for that gentle one, jest there made. At after meal with morning he communes with his uncle, and speaks of his passage, and plainly he said, Now, liege lord of my life, leave, I ask you. Ye know the cost of this case. Care I no more to tell you troubles thereof is nothing but trifle. But I am bound to go for the blow on tomorrow, to seek the gallant the green as God will be guide. And it goes on for a bit, does some name dropping, lamentations about Gawain's tragic fate, blah, blah, blah. Let's fast forward a little bit here. There was much secret sadness suffered in the hall, that one so worthy as Gawain should wend on that errand, to endure a doleful dent and deal blows no more, but die. The knight made ever good cheer and said, why should I fly? Of destinies dreary or dear, what can man do but try? I like him. He's got a good attitude. Not like that other guy. He was a dick. We'll call him Neowag, Gawain's evil counterpart. So yeah, Gawain is dressed to the nine with his fully polished steel armor, leather cape, Turkish silk, some clear plate mail, a braided mail shirt, and his fancy coat of arms. Hell, even Gringolet, his steed, is looking good with his shiny bling saddle. The story also makes it known that he and Gringolet all glittered and glowed as gleam of the sun. Just in case the theme hasn't sunk in yet. Sir Gawain requests leave and bids farewell to the court when King Arthur and Guinevere hook him up with some traveling swag, key among them being a shield with a pentagon on it. What, what, what? Now, I know what y'all are thinking. The hell there be satanic symbols all up in my Arthurian legends? Well, let's have a little PSA to learn more about the pentagle, shall we? The pentagram is a symbol that has been used throughout antiquity, even appearing as far back as the time of Sumeria. It was popular among Pythagoreans as it represented mathematical perfection, i.e. the golden ratio. It was used in many Asian cultures to represent the elements of life, and was a symbol of divine protection in Judaism and early Christianity. During the Middle Ages, the pentagram symbolized the five wounds of Christ, the five senses, and the five virtues of knighthood, which is how it applies to Sir Gawain here. In modern times, however, the pentagram has experienced a growing association with occultism and paganism. The pentagram became regarded as a symbol of devil worship during the Inquisition. Satanism and paganism were viewed as synonymous, even though paganism simply refers to those who are polytheistic. It was also used as a derogatory term for those who do not practice Christianity. The 1990s school system in the United States saw increased paranoia and religious pressure in regards to the pentagram, ascribing satanic or neo-pagan qualities to it. As a result, children were forbidden from wearing any clothing or jewelry with the symbol on it, and were forbidden from drawing it because separation of church and state and all. Thankfully, this was repealed in the new millennium due to it being unconstitutional. And now, back to our regularly scheduled program which is already in progress. Now that we're all caught up on the symbolism here, it's time for Sir Gawain to begin his quest. Everyone at court laments the fate of Sir Gawain like, well, he could have been an emperor, but nope. He just has to go be edgy and get his head cut off. Did he even ask for directions? <sighs> Impetuous kids. They just don't listen to their elders anymore. What's the world coming to? And I guess they're not entirely wrong because Gawain pretty much wanders all of Britain and even a few other countries just completely lost. He pulls off to the side of the road to occasionally ask for directions, but he just doesn't make any headway. So, like most protagonists in old-school role-playing games, Gawain starts out wandering aimlessly, doing side quests and hoping that he'll eventually activate the main quest flag. Sometimes with dragons he wars, and with wolves also. 
sometimes with wild men that dwelt in the woods, both with bulls and bears and boars at other times, and ogres that him annoyed from the high rocks, with bountiful breasts of bold buxom. Okay, maybe I added that last part. So yeah, he is straight old school RPGing it up. But he finally gets fed up and screeches to the heavens. The night well that tied, to Mary made his moan, that she reveal where to ride, that some dwelling him be shown. And I'm skipping a bit here. He rode in his prayer and cried for his misdeed. He signed himself repeatedly there and said, Cross of Christ me lead. Spectacles, testicles, wallet and watch. After whining and crossing himself, an awesome castle suddenly appears. And although the bridge was raised, when the porter of the castle saw Sir Gawain, he was like, Damn! I mean, by Saint Peter, yea, I will allow thee herein. And he was brought in with many servants who attended to him, mostly because Sir Gawain is just fine like sweet wine. So Sir Gawain meets the lord of the castle, who is impressive in his own right, and he is attended to and given the spa treatment, because this castle is posh. Silk, gold, embroidery, a roaring fireplace, warm stews, fish, a freaking bath. Sir Gawain is getting five-star treatment here, which is nice because he spent his winter solstice sleeping on ice and fighting animals and shit. This penance now ye take, and soon it shall be amended, that man much mirth did make, for wine in his head that wended. I agree. So Gawain sits by the fire with his host, eating double portions of super rich foods, because that just seems to be how they roll in Britain. During dinner, he's questioned by the castle folk, so he does the humble brag thing where he's like, Yeah, I'm from King Arthur's court, I'm Sir Gawain, it's no big deal. And everybody fangasms like, Oh my god, it's freaking Gawain, yo, And the nicest guy I've But it probably takes them about six hours to eat, so it's nighttime now. Everybody starts filing out to do their evening church service because they really need to finish up with the praying and get to bed. They have another full day of eating to get to tomorrow. The Lord leads Gawain to an enclosed pew where his hot wife is waiting for the service to start. And Gawain is all. <laughs> but the Lord grabs him like, okay, I know my wife is hot, but sit your horny ass down. Speaking of hot wives, <laughs> I'll have the truth from ye Bunby waifu. And I'll have it now. Uh, could you maybe wait? I've got, like, probably three more episodes to go, man. I've waited long enough. Will the secret of Kebony be revealed? Will Daki's fragile feline heart be able to endure? Find out on the next exciting episode of Little Red Rabbit Hoods, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight! <laughs>